limited senses lead to wrong conclusions. Whether there is an objectively existing world is the focus of debate between idealism and materialism. From the Buddhist perspective, this is also the focus of debate between the Yogacara and the Sultrantika schools. How do our views arise? First, our senses transmit information. Then, our sixth consciousness analyzes the information. And finally, we judge and come to a conclusion. The data or information on which judgments are based all come from our senses, the eyes, ears, nose, tongue and body. External objects cannot be separated from the five senses. Actually, I have also expounded this topic before. Seven or eight years ago, I wrote Yogacara Emptiness, and I found it in line with Ken Paul's teachings. What he taught is similar to what I wrote. When I wrote it, I also wrote it for non-Buddhists, analysing how the visual consciousness arises from a scientific perspective. After completing it, I started to publish it online in 2006. Later, I also talked about meditation on Yogacara emptiness. The earliest article was written over 10 years ago. Our teachings share the same essence. Kempu also used scientific explanations to help non-Buddhists understand Yogacara, the mind-only school. He guided us to understand Yogacara from the five senses. He called it limited senses lead to wrong conclusions, which is quite good. He also explained it from a physics perspective. I think his explanation is more understandable than mine. I talked about Yogacara and he also talked about Yogacara the illusory world. I think his point of entry is excellent, similar to what is illustrated in A Song of Debate Between Waking and Dream States. If our senses are reliable without any problems, then the information that they provide us will be accurate. If our senses have flaws or limitations, then the information they provide us will be wrong. Unfortunately, our senses are not reliable. We can understand this through the metaphor of the pebble explained earlier. Our senses are very limited and unreliable. We should understand that everything we see is unreal and illusory. The world that really exists in the here and now only lasts for one ten thousandth of a second. Of course, one second can be further divided into one hundred thousandths or one millionths, but for simplicity, let's consider one ten thousandth of a second as the present moment. If we grasp the present moment, then the world before and after it doesn't exist. This is because the world before the present moment has already disappeared and no longer exists, while the world after the present moment hasn't arisen, so it doesn't exist either. What really exists is the one ten thousandth of a second, and that is our world. For now, let's use the concept of moment instead of one ten thousandth of a second to make it easier to understand. However, moment is still a notion of time. In terms of one ten thousandth of a second, there is still a before and after, 
a notion of time and a process. One ten thousandth of a second can be further divided into one millionth. One millionth can be divided into ten parts, and there is still a before and after in the middle. In one ten thousandth of a second, there is also past, present, and future. Is there an end to the process of dividing time? No. One ten thousandth of a second can also be divided into three parts past, present, and future. The present moment can also be divided into three parts past, present, and future. As long as you have the notion of time, you can divide it endlessly. As long as you have the notion of time, you can always divide time into three parts past, present, and future. So, does time really exist? As we are discussing this question, we are still in the dimension of the conventional truth. However, truth is relative. Let's first discuss it from this dimension. The so-called now is just a moment. In this moment, the world seems to exist. Let's agree on this for now. The world arises in this moment. According to physics, electrons revolve around the atomic nucleus. However, Buddhism doesn't use the term revolve, but rather arise and cease. The choice of words here is worth noting. I think the expression in Buddhism is very accurate, because in the microscopic world, nothing really revolves. Revolving is also an illusion of the senses. For example, when an electron moves from the east side of the atomic nucleus to somewhere else, we perceive it as revolving. However, in reality, there is no electron that really revolves, because as soon as the electron arises in the east, it instantly ceases there. In other words, it arises and ceases. This is because as soon as it arises in the east, it instantly ceases. It's impossible for it to move. All phenomena arise and cease in the same moment. It hasn't even had the chance to move before it ceases. If we assume that this electron exists, it would take time for it to complete one rotation. Even if it moves just a tiny bit, it takes time. However, before it starts to revolve, it immediately ceases right after arising. Hence, all phenomena have never moved. In the Lotus Sutra, it is stated, All phenomena abide in the nature of reality. Worldly appearances also constantly abide in the nature of reality. All phenomena abide at their respective positions and have never moved. This is because all phenomena, upon arising, immediately cease. They haven't even started moving before they cease. The so-called movement is another manifestation. Of course, there is karma behind it. In fact, all phenomena arise and cease in the same moment. Similarly, the electron hasn't even had the chance to move before it ceases or dies. Then it arises and ceases in another location. This is the viewpoint of the Theravada tradition. In this moment, it arises and ceases in a location, and in the next moment, it arises and ceases in another location. Hence, 
it seems to be in motion. You have all learned the course, all conditioned things are impermanent, so I don't need to elaborate on it. This is explained clearly and thoroughly in All Conditioned Things Are Impermanent. You need to watch it several times and bear it in mind. And soon you will realise that this world is illusory because all phenomena arise and cease moment by moment. The electron ceases before it even begins to revolve, so how can it move from the east side to the west side? Similarly, how can the sun rise in the east and set in the west? It hasn't even risen before it instantly ceases at the point where it arises. It hasn't moved at all. Then, it arises and ceases again in another location. Hence, it is called arising and ceasing. When an electron moves from the east side of the atomic nucleus to somewhere else, it is perceived as motion in our cognition. However, in reality, no electron is actually moving. This is because the electron arises in the east and simultaneously ceases right there. In other words, it arises and immediately ceases in the same position. Its arising and ceasing are almost simultaneous. Subsequently, a new electron is born in front of the previous position. Then, in another location, a brand new electron arises. Almost simultaneously, it ceases in the same position. This is called arising and ceasing moment by moment. When we talk about arising and ceasing moment by moment, every day, it means that it arises and ceases in the same moment. In this way, electrons are constantly arising and ceasing in successive positions. However, from our visual perspective, it appears as though one electron is moving from one position to the second position, the third position, the fourth position, and so on. It's similar to a slideshow when each slide arises and ceases in an instant. When we connect these electrons together, we perceive the motion of an electron. In fact, the electron in the first position and the electron in each subsequent position have no connection. The electron in the east has already ceased and will never appear again. However, from the macroscopic perception, there is still an illusion of an electron in motion. In other words, when observing the microscopic world through a microscope, it appears as if an electron is moving. However, in reality, nothing is moving. Although they are similar, the later electrons are not the previous ones. That's why Buddhism refers to it as arising and ceasing. Similarly, for each of us, the aggregates of the previous moment and the aggregates of the subsequent moment are not the same person at all. There is no person. That's why we say there is no self. The aggregates of the previous moment and the aggregates of the subsequent moment are not even the same thing. So where is the self? Our perception is wrong because our senses are very poor and limited, while the conclusions derived from science are correct. However, if we use precise logic for reasoning, we will clearly find that the world is only this present moment and everything else is an illusion. This is just the viewpoint of the Hinayana, 
this moment appears to exist while everything else is non-existent and illusory. Here's an example from the macroscopic world. Several dozens of coloured lights are arranged in a row. In the first moment, the first light bulb turns on and immediately goes out. In the second moment, the second light bulb turns on and also immediately goes out. In this way, the third and fourth light bulbs, respectively, turn on and go out. There is no connection between the light bulbs. They are all independent. However, since the light bulbs cooperate seamlessly, when we look from a distance, it seems as if there is a light moving from the location of the first light bulb all the way to the location of the last light bulb. However, even elementary school students know that this is an error of the vision. In reality, there is no light moving. That's why Buddhism refers to it as arising and ceasing. This example is quite good. I remember in the course, All Conditioned Things Are Impermanent, I used the example of playing cards. Take a stack of identical playing cards, for example, a stack of Ace of Hearts, and place them in a sequence. Each playing card is different, but they look exactly the same, and they appear the same in every moment. The same goes for the light bulbs. When looking from a distance, it appears as if there is light moving. However, each light bulb remains in its own position, lighting up for a moment and then going out. If the timing is just right, in this moment a light bulb turns on and goes out, in the next moment the next light bulb turns on and goes out, you will perceive it as if a light is moving. This is how we generate illusions. What you see is a point of light moving in a line. This is the illusion of us ordinary beings. In fact, the light bulbs just turn on and go out in their own positions, lighting up for a moment and then going out. Fireworks are the same. When they are launched upwards, it appears as if they are moving. In fact, each burst of light is different. The light emitted in the previous moment is different from the light emitted in the subsequent moment because different substances are burning. It's as if a light is moving, but this is the illusion we generate. The same goes for fireworks. What we perceive is the movement of light. This example is quite good and convincing. However, we never consider the world to be constantly arising and ceasing. Instead, we believe that time can connect the past and the future. Therefore, we live entirely in illusions. We believe that we first go to work at a certain place and then go back home. We believe that it is the same I doing it different things. We never consider that our existence is only in a moment, nor do we think that the world is just a moment. This is because everything is arising and ceasing rapidly, and our naked eye cannot capture it. A moment is also relative. The time of arising and ceasing that we can perceive is called a moment and there are even subtler moments. This is the view of Hinayana Buddhism, the indivisible particle and indivisible moment. It is called indivisible because, as humans, we cannot divide it any further. From the perspective of Mahayana Buddhism, even moments don't exist. How marvellous! It's difficult for us to comprehend it. 
it's very hard to realize the emptiness of phenomena. According to Mahayana Buddhism, all phenomena are empty in nature, and time is also empty in nature. However, according to the exoteric teachings of Mahayana Buddhism, there is still a notion of time. It believes that although phenomena appear, there is still a notion of time. Only after reaching the stage of the great perfection, or seeing at the true nature of reality, will the view transcend time and space. In the Mahayana exoteric view of dependent arising and the nature of emptiness, there is still the notion of time. According to this view, although all phenomena are empty in nature, they still arise. The notion of time hasn't been completely negated. Therefore, this view is not ultimate. Only the supreme view of the great perfection or seeing at the true nature of reality in the Chan school has truly transcended time and space and negated the notion of time and space. However, it's not easy to attain that state. What we are thinking now is all delusion. Moreover, we cannot make the past, present and future meet, nor can we gather them in one place. If the past, present and future could gather in one place, then yesterday, today and tomorrow could also meet at the same time. This would make our notion of time chaotic. Thus, these three cannot come together. Hence, we all live in an illusory world. Because of this, Buddhism describes the world as illusory, like a dream, an illusion, a bubble and a shadow. This is a very scientific world view without any religious element. Well, what it actually means is not there is no element of faith, but rather there is no element of blind faith. You should have watched The Matrix. This movie tells us that the life, work and everything around humans are just computer programs, not real things. If you firmly believe that life is so meaningless and illusory, why would you live? You would not choose to live. The people in the Matrix live in an unreal world. Everything is just computer programs, not real things. Actually, our situation is similar. Our world is completely the manifestation of our karma. Countless information is stored in our storehouse consciousness, constantly manifesting. We believe everything to be real, but in reality, it is all the manifestation of the storehouse consciousness. We are just like a computer with a huge capacity hard drive, displaying various information continuously and simultaneously. I find that computers are really similar to the human brain. The first time I used a computer, I was amazed. It can display multiple images, open multiple pages, and play audios concurrently. Humans are similar. We can use our eyes, ears, nose, tongue, and body at the same time, and the whole world can manifest concurrently. Humans and computers are really similar, both arising from the seeds in the storehouse consciousness. Through simulation, computers are getting increasingly closer to the human brain. This American movie, The Matrix, is useful. 
It might inspire you to ponder that we, including our brains, live in an illusory realm. Today, we also live in an illusory world. For us, this illusory world looks very real. As long as we don't observe, everything seems real. However, if one day we start to doubt our senses and observe carefully, we will realise we have been living in such an illusory world all the time. At this point, we are faced with two paths. If you wish to continue living in this illusory world, life after life, then you don't need to observe anything. Everything will remain as usual. This is called samsara. If we choose this path, we will continue living in this illusory world without liberation, being reborn again and again and experiencing suffering. If you don't want to continue being lost in this illusory world, then you need to build a new world view, which is the Buddhist world view. What is the use of this world view? It can bring us wisdom and compassion. With wisdom and compassion, we can accurately view money, emotions, marriage and the world. Through a series of Buddhist practices, we can eventually attain Buddhahood or enlightenment. It helps us see the ultimate truth and turns our minds into the truest state. Our true nature will manifest the realm of reality. After the storehouse consciousness is transformed into wisdom, we can freely manifest. At that time, we can freely manifest, unlike now, where we are completely, passively manifesting. The information in the storehouse consciousness keeps manifesting. Due to our attachment to self, we become confused and are caught up in illusions. We are really confused, like a bull following the cloth during a bullfight. Humans are also like this. In fact, all external objects arise from our minds. They are manifested by our own hard drive. However, since you forget that this is your own hard drive, the small I that you are attached to is lost in the illusions. Therefore, we should first eliminate the attachment to self in person. If you don't eliminate the attachment to self in person, then no matter what you practice, you won't succeed. Because you are bound by the attachment to self in person, you are unable to access new worlds and see a truer reality. Once you eliminate the attachment to self in person, your world view will greatly elevate. After that, when you further eliminate the attachment to self in phenomena and ultimately see the true nature of reality, you will elevate further. The Buddha's three turnings of the Dharma wheel consist of these three steps. The first step is to eliminate the attachment to self in person. The second step is to eliminate the attachment to self in phenomena. And the third step is to realize the true nature of reality. The Buddha's three turnings of the Dharma wheel are divided into three steps. Shakyamuni Buddha's three turnings of the Dharma wheel are the three stages of realizing emptiness. They must be practiced step by step and cannot be skipped. The first step is to eliminate the attachment to self and person, after which your mind will instantly pervade the universe, because the storehouse consciousness is vast. Our mind will expand instantly, 
and our insight will become different. All right, that's all for today's lecture.